The funny thing about working on a doll head is the outcome is never quite as good as it would be on a human being. But my feeling is, is if you can dial in the technical ability, working on a human actually starts to become significantly easier. Hello, my name is Aaron Scott Lacey with a simple lesson. Today, I'm really excited to share with you my thoughts on the mullet. The mullet is a really intriguing shape and style because it goes against the grain of what we consider to be conventionally beautiful. It's suited for someone that likes to stand out, that likes to have something that's maybe a bit avant-garde, asymmetrical, all of the fun exploration that someone can have with their own aesthetic. So what I plan to really share with you is a very simple, detailed, technical breakdown of my approach to the mullet, some of the key aspects, things to look for, questions to actually ask your client during the consultation. The consultation is honestly the most important part of my service to a new guest because it gives them confidence in my ability to envision a shape and style that's going to look suitable and flattering for them. So hopefully you enjoy this process. I aim to show you what goes on in my brain and of how I look at this non-conventional shape and style, but to let you really flex as an artist to have fun and make it personal for the person that's sitting in your chair. So this process is gonna be satisfying because we are working on a doll head that already has long hair. Her texture is of a medium density. She has some bend and wave, borderline curly hair, but we're going to approach this style in a very technical manner. And so I'll show you all the decisions that I make in terms of achieving the mullet. During the consultation process, I really like to gauge whether someone truly wants a mullet or whether they want their close relative, the shag. Mullets and shags actually share common similarities in terms of what we see. We're in a day and age right now where oh, there's a lot of retro vibes. You see a lot of influence from the 70s where there's a lot of curtain action, a lot of uh, framing and layering that's happening through the front, and then it drops down into some length in the back. And in my estimation, one of the key distinctions between a mullet and a shag is the mullet just has exaggerated length in the back. So you can easily make a mullet into a shag by condensing that extra length that lives in the back. By doing that, you almost immediately have what would be considered a shag, a short, basic, layered haircut. Something that's really important to me as an artist is to not overly project my art onto my guests. And so what I don't want to have happen is that 90% of the people that sit in my chair and that leave my chair all walk away with mullets. I think that it's a really important aspect to actually consider what your client wants and to not overly push out this reoccurring idea that mullets suit everyone. They don't. They're not conventionally beautiful, but it takes the right type of personality to be able to rock it and have fun with it and know that we don't need to necessarily conform to all the traditional beauty standards. So I've gone ahead and washed the doll head and organized everything by combing it all back. Shapes and styles can be stressful because we place tons of emphasis on the outcome, what we want the final product to be. And rather than think the big, big picture, what I really like to do is focus on zones within the haircut. That way it keeps me nice and organized and it helps me emphasize specific areas of someone's bone structure that we want to accentuate. My starting process is gonna be directly down the center because this haircut is going to be neutral in terms of where it's being pushed and where it's being positioned when she wears it. So working with a center part, what I'm gonna do is part from the center and I'm gonna bring it all the way back to the crown. And so you can start to see this split. The kids will love this, the center part. And from that center part, 
from the frontal will make our way to the apex. So the apex is going to be the highest point vertically and the highest point horizontally on the head shape. Now if you want a good indicator of where that actually is, you can take your comb and you can place it directly on the head. Where the comb actually starts to leave, that's where the apex is. I'll actually turn her so you can see a very clear visual of that. see right where this point is. That's going to be your highest point vertically and your highest point horizontally. This is what we want to intentionally live forward to create her fringe. From the apex, we're going to fan out to the recession points. Now a safe play for how far you actually fan out is working from the arch of the brow. So within our recession point, we tend to line up with that arch of the brow. And the reason why that's a safe play is because anytime hair dries, it expands and it spreads. And so if I were to actually take this section all the way to the point of where her hairline starts to become vertical, the hair that comes forward no longer just lives forward, it starts to actually move over here and it lives into the sides. But we're actually starting to affect what she's actually going to see is hair that's intended to live here is actually making its way over here. Now a quick tip on sectioning. I see this a lot, stylists struggle with all of the little fine details of getting in there and working their wrists and doing all of this stuff with the comb. If you look at the design of the comb, it's simple. You've got all of these perfect rows. And so what you could do is comb all the hair, groom it, gather it in the direction that you want to go. And I'm from the apex. I'm literally just going to comb this hair all down. And now I have all of these individual rows to choose from. So rather than getting in there really difficult with my wrists, I'm literally just going to place my thumb right here and separate. And you can see how nice and organized that is because the tool is working for you. It's creating all of those perfect rows and it's gathering the hair and grooming it. And so you get a really nice clean section. Now on this opposite side, we're going to repeat the same process, but rather than using the comb to create those perfect lines, I'm going to use the comb in conjunction with my fingers to actually separate the hair. So I'll show you how I do that. And it's a really simple, easy process. I'm gonna place my pointing finger and I'm gonna start from the apex. And as I make my way down, I'm gonna use that finger to actually pull and separate the hair that's not within the section. And that's another way to help organize this process. A lot of it is fluid movement. So I'm utilizing how my arms are designed to help pull towards me. I'm not stood over here and trying to work away from myself. I'm more in control by pulling everything to me. The fringe is coming from the apex and it's coming down to the recession point that's in line with the arch of the brow on both sides. I'll clip this away. Now we need to determine how high up the wall of shortness of what's living through the sides is going to go. And a key stylistic choice for this shape is, is the top actually going to connect to the sides or are we going to slightly disconnect the top from the sides? Because that means that we could have extra length on top to expand and to move around and prop up without being so directly tied to the wall that we create through the sides. We know that we want distinction from the sides and the back, right? We want the back to be considerably longer than the sides. We also have to consider whether or not the sides will have a sense of flow and connection to the back, or do we see an immediate steep drop off of disconnect of something that's condensed through here 
and then getting drastically longer towards the back. And that's a personal choice of what someone ideally wants to see. And this is where during the consultation, I like to give people the contrasting options. Like, do we want to see flow or do we want something stark and contrast and carved out? For the purpose of what we're doing today and to stay really nice and organized, we're going to create that stark contrast where we cut this down dramatically shorter and then we leave a little bit of extra length on top to maneuver around and let her texture play. Determining where we want the sides to be positioned and how high up we want to go, we need to take into consideration the parietal ridge. So that's the bone that goes along this ridge, this natural round that we've got. The higher up I position the top section, the more I take out from the sides, the leaner it becomes. The lower the section goes, the more opportunity there is for the top to really come out and play and hang over and veil what's happening through the sides. So I wanna be somewhere in the middle. I don't wanna fully commit to tons of shortness making its way up the head shape. I'd rather be somewhere in the middle. And that's why I'll actually use the parietal ridge as a great starting point for us. And if you're unsure of where that bone is and where that round is, once again, use your comb and place it right on the head. And you can see where the comb actually leaves, that's where the bone is positioned. So organization within this haircut is extremely important. And the first section that I took made its way back to the crown. So to keep myself on track, I'm actually going to separate the back first. That way I know what's living through the sides and what's intentionally living through the back. Now the crown has several rounds. You've got the high crown, you've got the lower crown, and then you eventually make your way to the occipital bone. So if I wanted to position it from the lower crown, I'm gonna place my comb like this. If I want the high crown, I'm gonna position it like this. And I'll show you from this angle, that way you can see it a little clearer low crown, high crown. From the low crown, I'm taking a slightly curved section that makes its way to the mastoid. The mastoid is the bone that is directly behind your ear. So once again, I'm placing my finger on the comb to help separate the hair. And what I have is a nice and organized section that's starting from the lower point of the crown and making its way towards that mastoid. So now what I'm left with are the side panels and the top that needs to be sectioned away. I know I want the top to be slightly disconnected from the sides, so I'm gonna organize the top first. So I'm grooming all the hair in the direction I plan on sectioning it. And I'll place my comb directly on the parietal ridge. And now I'm gonna use my thumb as I push this comb and create a fluid motion to help separate this hair. And I'll repeat that process on this opposite side. Now I have a ton of emphasis on organization for this haircut. The mullet is kind of loosely considered to be a sloppy haircut, but a technical approach allows you the ability to actually replicate in the future because you have a really simple blueprint and design layout. And so what I want to show you is the clips that we're working with and how we've sectioned this haircut. That way we place emphasis on all the important areas of a mullet so that we can accurately achieve what we're after. Nine times out of 10 these days, I start the haircut right in the front. It's important for me to understand how important it is to position something on someone so that they can see it immediately and get comfortable with it and actually start to envision the overall finished product. I'm adding a significant amount of water. That way I have even elasticity as I work with this hair because I'm gonna be stretching it, I'm gonna be tugging on it. I wanna see clean cutting lines without an abundance of frizz. 
And so I'll bring all of this hair forward and we'll start from the apex right in the center and bring a section that's right in the middle forward. We don't want everything to come down to zero elevation. We actually want to form something within this dimension that actually lifts and expands and has some fullness. Her texture lives in 3D so we can really encourage natural volume as we build the shape. Is I'll pull this hair straight out and I'm going to use the curvature of my finger to actually simulate head shape. And using my mirror to let me know where I'm at and where I'm actually elevating that hair to. It can be very challenging to know exactly where you're at if you're not utilizing your mirror because you might think that you're in the right spot, but you could be over here. And now I want to gauge where I'm at, where this length is sitting in this moment. Her hair is wet. There's weight pulling it down. We have to anticipate where this length will actually live once it's dry. It's going to shrink. How much do we want to go for it? Do we want to play it safe and have this sort of curtainy effect? Or do we want to put something bolder and stronger, a more defined fringe? And I say, for the sake of what we're doing, let's take it a little shorter and let's just see what happens. And this gives me an idea that once this dries, we're going to be up in this territory, which is what I'm shooting for. Now, if you take a look at the head shape, you see a steep drop off in this curvature happening. So the safest play is to bring everything into section number one. That will leave the most amount of length within the recession where there's this actual lack of hair. And so what I'll do is I'll gather all the remaining hair and I'm going to lift it up into section number one. Checking where I'm at. And I'm using a fair amount of tension on the hair because I want there to be a reaction. I want it to spring back like a rubber band. And you can see this dynamic of it creating length within this corner, within the recession point. But I also need to just consider for a moment what the aesthetic of a mullet really is. Short and long. So this is already getting longer when actually I want to encourage more shortness. So that brings me back to section number one. And this is where I think that it's so important as an artist and a designer to make sure you're firmly establishing where you want to be from the very beginning. There's nothing worse than going through an entire haircut just to have your client say, you know, can you take it a little bit shorter? and they mean a little bit shorter from everywhere. So it's great to kind of check in with your guests and see how they're feeling, see how they're feeling after that first spot. Have them actually feel the hair and move it around and see what's happening. This is gonna to be too long for what I'm after. So I'm gonna to return to section number one. And that's already more like it. And with these remaining sections making our way towards the recession point, we're actually going to follow her head shape. We're not going to overly excessively lift up into section one. We're going to bring section one straight out and we're going to follow her head shape. So you see that I'm over here and not over here. And 
now I can remove section number one. And I'm using section number two as a reference. So anytime you're grabbing a section and you're combing it, you're moving the section. So I comb from this side and it's actually moving the section towards me. And a really good rule is to always comb the side of the section that you're about to cut. That way it really keeps you on track. Uh, it maintains your level of elevation or over direction. Now I'm jumping over to the side, but I'm still gonna position my body on this side because this gives me the most amount of control cutting on the outside of my fingers. I'm more likely to lift the hair and be able to follow that curvature. If I stand on this side, I'll actually work from the highest point and I'll start to try to make my way down and follow her curvature, but I'm more inclined to actually leave it longer as we make our way towards the frontal. And really thinking about where my elevation is. If I'm unsure, I can use the mirror and I can actually look to see if I'm following her head shape. Since I'm stood on this side, I'm actually more inclined to overly lift towards myself. And I'm combing the side that I'm about to cut. And if I need more reassurance of where my elevation is, I'll use the mirror and I'll actually look to see if I'm following head shape. The more I follow her natural curvature, the more it takes out of this area. The more I actually exaggerate how far I'm elevating, the more length it actually leaves. Now coming through and cross-checking this, before I even cross-check, I think it's great to actually just take a visual reference. Move the hair around a little bit, and take a look at what we actually see. I can see there's a little more length on this side. Doesn't surprise me because I'm more inclined to pull towards myself and have it get a little bit longer. I'll come back through and I'll really focus on my elevation. And make sure I'm pulling it right out from the head and that already looks better to me. So cross-checking, really important. Our section patterns went like this, and we want to check in the opposite way. So nice and organized. I basically want to take the same section size as I did when I took my initial sections. And now I also have to consider what the elevation was. Where did I actually cut the hair? And so I don't want to just pull this all straight up to the ceiling. I need to actually pull it straight out from the head. And I'm looking for a line that generally resembles her natural curvature. As I'm going through and checking, I'm actually chipping in to the line. If we consider the general aesthetic of a mullet, it's usually soft and separated. And since her hair has these waves and bends to it, it could be a little challenging to really make sure that I got in and chipped into every edge. So just to be sure, you could come back through with your initial sections and chip into it. Right now I'm breaking tension. So you can see I, I pulled it out, but then I'm kind of making it easier on myself. I wouldn't recommend breaking tension when you're putting the initial shape and technique in, but it's a little more forgiving after you've already established it and you're going through and just separating the edges. So now that I made that adjustment, I'm feeling really good about what we're seeing. We're seeing her texture start to jump up and expand and live a little bit out here. The shorter the texture gets, the stronger it becomes. But a lot of times with waves and some curl types, 
if it gets so short, you actually start to lose the consistency of texture because the hair no longer has all of the surface area to start to bend and wave like that. So you might notice a bit of texture change as you condense something, you cut it down significantly shorter. So we're gonna work on the sides now, and the sides are really going to establish how severe this haircut's going to be. We wanna go for it. We wanna go from long to short. And water is really important in this process. I'm gonna continually return to the spray bottle because the more water that's on the hair, the easier it is in my hands to actually manipulate the hair. Since we're not looking for a point of connection in the back by the mastoid, we're actually gonna start this process right at the top of the ear, the widest point horizontally on the head shape. Now, if I wanted a connection point and a better sense of flow front to back, and I was looking for a shape that gradually got longer towards the back, I would actually start at the hairline and then systematically make my way back. What I'm aiming for is something flat and flat. So from that widest point, I'll take a vertical section. And if you prefer using clips to keep you organized, by all means. I could never fault someone for wanting to stay very organized through this process. Now my finger angle is going to determine what happens within this vertical dimension. The flatter I keep my fingers, the leaner it is. The more we start to create a wall. The more I start to kick out my fingers, the more weight we leave in this corner. And now the third option to this process is to actually totally copy head shape. The higher up this panel starts to go, the more natural curvature we start to see within the head. Right now we're at a point where things are very flat. So if I put my comb right against the head, you can see things are flat. I just want to copy that. I don't want it to wedge out. I want to create distinction from what lives on the sides and what lives on the top. And my fingers are actually slightly pressed up against the head so that it keeps me on track. Now what I've done is create this wall and it leaves a little bit of length down around the edge. That's something that we could come through after we've dried it and we could carve this out to totally expose the top of the ear. But what I really am focused on right now is this peak of weight that's situated right at the parietal ridge and whether or not it's warped out, like it's fanning out or whether it's relatively nice and flat. I like that it's nice and flat. It means that it's not going to get bushy or heavy too quickly. My first section I cut on the inside of my fingers with my fingertips pointed down. But now that I'm gonna work towards the front hairline, I'm actually gonna switch my hand position and have my fingertips point up. By having my fingertips point up, it puts me in a better position of control to be able to work this section towards this direction. My right foot is really important. I want that right foot to be directly in line with my section because that's going to determine where I actually send the hair to. My left foot will take a step forward. That way I can get in a position where I can actually see the vertical dimension. And I'm gonna comb this section back into number one, keeping my fingers nice and flat to maintain that vertical wall. Now I'm aiming for something that's flat. So if I keep my right foot in this position for the entire panel, it means I'm gonna bring everything back to number one. I don't wanna bring everything back to number one, I actually wanna bring it right back to the wall. So I'll actually take a slight sidestep and repeat that same process where I'm bringing this next section slightly back just to the wall.
And this is how you create a more square type of horizontal shape. So as I comb this down, what that's actually done is it's allowed for the roundness that someone naturally has through there. And by bringing it back to the wall, when I come back through and check this, I don't see a steep drop off of weight and I don't see something that's hugging her natural head shape. And once again, I'm gonna flip my hand position. So the thumb leads the way. This helps so that I'm not continually trying to do this as I work towards the back because what starts to happen is it starts to negatively impact your over direction. It becomes really challenging and you get these awkward arms where you're trying to fit in this position because it's comfortable. You really just have to put yourself in a better state of control and by flipping your thumb leads the way and it keeps you on track. So really what you want to consider is as we make our way towards the back, the head starts to turn. The good indicator is work your comb to the head shape and see just how much it turns. We want to create a flat panel. And if you look at it from a vertical dimension, you can see how much extra length you'll get in this area where the head really starts to turn. My natural tendency as I work in this direction is to excessively over direct. All I want to do right now is bring the hair straight out back to the wall behind me. And I'm stood directly in front of what I'm working with. That helps keep me on track. Now that the head is really starting to turn, I'll take a step towards that next section and I'll make sure that I'm combing this hair straight back to the wall. And so as I cross check, I'm looking to see whether or not the hair is actually getting longer towards the back. I want to keep this consistent flat wall Now that I've cut that first panel, I'm going to go back through and I'm going to refine it. And we know we want it to be intentionally short and especially around the edges. I want it to be cut clean around the edge. We're going to chip away at this. So I did half the work in this direction and then I switched body position to now come and approach it this way. Now by putting a line in, we might have a little bit of extra length and weight that's situated on top of that line. That's what was layered. Now once it's dry, we might work a little bit of that hair out and slightly graduate the edge. That way we don't see a steep drop off in that area. All right, now that our panel is done on her left side, I'm gonna jump over and cut the panel on our right side. Now you probably noticed as I worked that left panel, I took vertical sections and I didn't cut away any of this hair. Basically, I left all of this hair intact and cut it individually as I worked those vertical panels. Now that's a lot of hair to have to wrangle as you're manipulating it with your comb and your hands and fingers. So to make this process easier, you can simply come through and reduce half of it. That's less hair that you're having to overly manipulate in your hands and it makes it a bit easier. We know we're going short. I'm going to start over the highest point of her ear and I'm gonna cut on the inside of my fingers. The reason why I'm choosing to cut on the inside of my fingers is because they're flat. If I cut on the outside of my fingers, my fingers actually have this tendency to curve and follow her natural contour. So you can kind of see the difference between this and this.
I've got my elbow lifted up in the air and this makes sure that this hair is actually coming straight out of the head. If I drop my elbow, I'm more inclined to pull that hair down, which means it'll actually get heavier towards the top. So now that I'm moving forward in this direction, I'm gonna continue taking vertical sections and I'm gonna send this hair straight back to the wall and that'll create a flat horizontal panel My body position is I'm stood directly in front of what I'm working and I'm actually pulling this hair towards myself and not overly manipulating the hair backwards. If I start sending this hair backwards, it's going to get dramatically longer towards the front. You'll get that steep drop off. I'm on to my last section. and I'll comb this hair down and see what it's actually doing. And what it's actually doing is it's mimicking what happens naturally with the hairline. We all have the little area of our hairline where it drops down almost into a sideburn. So even though we're creating this flat horizontal dimension, we still have to imagine what happens naturally with her hairline. And that's where you can come through and you can refine and you can carve something out that you wanna see. To cross check this, I'll stand directly in front and I'll come through and check what's happening horizontally. I'm putting my comb in the hair and I'm lifting upwards as opposed to combing the hair down because if I comb the hair down, it means I'm actually elevating the hair lower than where it was actually cut. I'd be more inclined to comb the hair down if my technique was graduation. If I wanted that buildup of weight, rather than overly lifting the hair, I'm ready to finish out this panel. And once again, I'm gonna bring everything back to the wall. So I'm aiming flat this way, and I want it to be flat this way. My right foot is directly in line with that first section, and I'll take a step forward with my left foot, and I'll comb the side that I'm about to cut. Being in a contorted body position like this allows me to actually see what's happening within that vertical dimension. If I'm stood like this, I can't actually see what's happening vertically. I have to guess or I have to use the mirror and it puts me in a really odd spot. So by positioning myself in a way like this, it gets me in a spot where I can actually see what's happening top to bottom. Now, since I'm traveling, I need to make minor adjustments to my own body position. That way I stay on track. Each section is gonna be about the size of one of my fingers. My two fingers are holding each of these sections, so it's pinching this hair in this spot mid-air. So the larger the section that I take while utilizing a traveling guide, the more hair is being manipulated and pushed into a spot that isn't where it actually lives. This is where you start to have waves in your haircut, where when you look at it horizontally, there's weird little bits of inconsistency happening. And that's because we want to rush and we want to take larger sections. The only time you can really take larger sections is when you have a stationary guide and you're condensing your section. That means you're bringing everything back to section number one. So with each of these sections, I made slight adjustments to where I was actually positioning my foot and I was bringing it back to the wall, so everything coming straight back. And what I'm looking for when I'm checking this is whether or not I see something that's flat. And there's a little bit of extra length hanging out back here in the corner. So that tells me I need to reassess where my right foot is and re-bring this section out and trim a little bit off of it. I'm ready to come through and carve out 
the area that's situated around her ear to tighten things up. And so I'll usually use that first spot, like the peak of the ear, as the meeting point so that I work in these small areas. So I'll comb the hair down, let it fall naturally. And I'll start chipping away at it, little by little. I'm not looking for one solid chop. I want to go at it little by little because it gives you more options and it gives you a better sense of control of how you work your blade and how comfortable you feel with the blade. The longer you do this, the more your blade should feel like a natural extension of your arm so you can get into some of those tight areas. And so as I'm working, I'm coming in and I'm slightly backing out. I'm coming in and I'm slightly backing out, little by little. You get in this flow and this rhythm. Now something that I have to consider as I'm looking at each of these sides, this side has water in it, this side doesn't. So their appearances are going to be different. I either need to dry this side to get it to look like what's happening over here, or I need to wet this side to get it look like what's happening over here. Because if I started trying to nitpick and perfectly match things up in their current state, it's gonna put me in a disproportionate state because there's different things happening moisture-wise. All right, so you can see short layered panels on each side, a short fringe that's starting to expand and has fun playfulness. Now I need to decide whether or not I want to focus on the top or whether or not I want to establish the layers that are going to work out to the length. And I think it'll be fun for us to establish the length so that we see the clear visual. You have to imagine it from her point of view. She's seeing all of this hair cut down short and where her hair is at right now is it's all tucked up in a way. So she might be getting nervous that she's not gonna have anything down here left once we're all finished. So this is once again how I'm prioritizing my perception of her overall feeling about this and ready to drop this down and dial this in so that she starts to feel good about the choice that she made choosing this type of style. Now on this back panel, we're going to utilize a concave layering technique. Now there's two techniques, there's concave and there's convex. And the simplest way to talk about what those things are Convex follows someone's curvature, follows natural contour, follows what we were born with. Concave is when it starts to divert from that. Now when working with length, anytime you establish length first, it becomes all about protecting the length that you've established. Concave is actually a really fun technique to play with because you can exaggerate and you can work out to really long lengths while having something fun happen through the inside. What I plan on doing right now is actually working the interior first. That way we're not limiting what we do with the inside by trying to protect a pre-established length. If we look at her length right now, it's long, right? It's hanging down really long compared to what's happening through the sides. And so I think for us, it's good to anticipate what's a length that we actually want to see and work towards and what, what does the inside look like to support that length. Now, something I like to consider is what the lengths are at the widest points of the head and how do those actually look in relation to one another. So take a look at the length that's here right now. It's short. Take a look at this length right now. It's what we would consider long. So I have to choose something in between what's happening at the sides, which is right here, and in between this so that it actually functions well and has a pleasing aesthetic. I would opt for something generally in this territory because what we're gonna do is we're going to fan out towards the length. I'm gonna start in the center taking a vertical section and I'm going to drop her down so that I'm working within my center. The last thing I want to do is send hair off over here 
to where I can't see the cutting line, I can't control my over direction or my elevation. So if I drop her down, I'm confident that I'm gonna be working within this area and I can actually take a step in this direction if the length gets longer. So since we're working in this panel, it has a lot of hair, I'll actually split the vertical section in half and I'll position myself in a way so that I'm working with the hair that is going to naturally fit within my two fingers. And as I'm working with this section, in order to reduce the strain on my wrist, I'm actually going to turn my hand and actually face myself. This helps so that I'm not overly contorting my wrist and making it challenging to work with this hair. So by coming through, with the comb, my hand is facing me, and my finger angle is going to determine how long the hair will actually be at the bottom. The more I exaggerate this angle, the more length you have to work with at the bottom. Now that I've worked that first section within this vertical section, I can come through and I can gather what remains at the bottom. And I can see my previous cutting line and I can continue to work outwards. And so what that leaves us with are these layers that are relatively short on the inside and it makes its way down to the length that was already there to begin with. So if we take an honest look at it, that's the length that's living at the bottom now. This is the length that we started with. It's out of frame. So we took about that much off of the length. The interior is where all the magic happened, where we see all of this texture really come to life. Water, once again, is going to help my sense of control within this back panel. The more water I add, the easier it becomes to actually see my guide with vertical sections. And I'll keep myself in the box. So I'm gonna send the hair back to the wall behind me. So I'm pulling straight out and I'm combing the side that I'm about to work with, that I'm about to cut. My hand is facing me. And in the salon, I would like my mirror to be right here. That way I can actually see where the hair is being sent to. I'm making sure I see my guide, making sure I'm kicking my elbow up so that I can get longer in this direction. I'm gonna condense to the round of the head because I want all of this hair to come back to the wall. Paying close attention to elevation. Where am I actually lifting this hair to? Am I down here or am I up here? These are really important things because we want consistency within this technical shape. And this is her left side that I've now worked that layer into. And I think it's great if you can see some of the contrast. So this is the side that's been cut. And there's a lot of texture that's coming out to play now and it's working down to the length. Whereas this is the side that hasn't been touched. It's long, it's heavy, gravity is pulling things down, right? Now my body position is going to remain consistent by standing on this side. Let's talk about what it would actually look like to stand on this side and work from the outside in. Nine times out of 10, I would probably cut the length too short. When you're working from the length, it becomes really challenging to actually protect that length. And so I'd be maneuvering inwards which is really dangerous. And I think that we're in a position right now where we want to work out to the length. We wanna protect that length. I'm in a much better state of control when I'm working from the inside out to the length. 
palm is facing my face and I can see my cutting line and I start to turn my fingers to encourage that exaggerated length. I've got my cutting line that's working out this way. The sections are about the size of one of my fingers because my fingers are what's controlling this haircut. I'm taking each section and I'm lifting it and pinching it within my fingers. Sending this hair straight back to the wall using a high elevation above 90. Now we'll condense this last section So the theme of this haircut is very boxy, boxes on each panel. And so in order to accurately see in my cross check, I need to position myself like we're in a box. So I'll position myself right in front of that section. That way I can see a flat line. I'm checking this on the outside of my fingers because if I check on the outside of my fingers, I have more of a tendency to lift the hair to where it was actually cut. If I check on the inside down here, I'll have a tendency to pull the hair down. So checking on the outside is the best call to adequately and accurately see my guide. If when I lifted this hair up and I saw notches taking out almost squares and cubes, it would tell me that as I brought the hair up to this point, when I took my next section, as I brought it up, maybe I cut it at this point. So that's where you'll start to see the jack-o'-lantern teeth within your cross check. And that tells me that you would need to focus a bit more on your elevation. And I love the stark contrast from what's happening through the sides versus what's happening through the back. This is not the safe play. And you can even see that side profile really carved out, intentional, and then all this fun length flowing the top. Just to quickly recap, we established the fringe first. We took a forward section following her natural contour, utilizing head shape as we worked so that we didn't end up with excessive length through the corners. Then we made our way over to the side panels where we created a flat panel horizontally, a flat panel vertically so that it's nice and lean and that it flares out just a little bit once the head starts to round. That reaches a point of where we make the distinction from the sides to the back. The back is intentionally disconnected. I chose a length in the crown that would allow this texture to really come out and play and expand and flick outwards. And that's where you can see the difference in lengths that we've got from the back to the sides. There's no way that we wanted to connect this through because I wanted to preserve an adequate amount of length to the back to really exaggerate this, this look, this shape and style. So within the back, we utilized a concave layering technique and we worked that in a square shape and that leaves extra length in the corners where the head starts to turn. Now we're gonna make our way to the top and we always have options, right? So this is an opportunity for us to make a determination of whether we want points of connection or whether we want this to be its own distinct unit. We've got a point at the apex where we've established a length. We have a point at the crown where we've established a length. Do I want this length to fit through or do I want it to not fit at all? There's not a right or wrong, but it's great to have options and it gives you ideas on ways to play with it. How abstract do we want to make it? This obviously isn't connected to anything, so this was taken down intentionally short. I love the idea of options in terms of having flexibility to move hair around. Where we're at within this horizontal dimension, if I pull these lengths up and let you take a look at it, you could probably imagine something fitting through, starting shorter through here and making our way just slightly longer towards the back. 
All right, so based on what I just showed you guys in terms of where these lengths are positioned, I could imagine slight connectivity through this top area. But what I don't want to have happen is that we leave so much hair within these corners that it totally flops over on top of this and totally covers the cleanliness of what's happening through the sides. So as I work this top panel, we'll follow her contour, we'll follow her head shape so that it hugs in and then it's just something that's slightly playful throughout the inside. This process is gonna feel like connecting the dots. I'm gonna take all that hair that's pushed forward and I'm gonna comb it all back right now, returning to the center. I'm gonna take a section that makes its way back to the crown. And since we're working short to long, I'm gonna stand on this side because this puts me in a position to naturally make that happen. If I stand on this side, since I'm right-handed, I'd be working from long to short. And I know that she is not afraid of going short. We have talked about her having a mullet. So I'm gonna utilize my finger angle to still cut this down fairly short but to work out towards the pre-existing length that's sitting in the crown. The more I angle my fingers outward, the easier it becomes to meet into that length. And to make this process easier, I'm gathering these long lengths, but then I'm splitting it in half so that I'm not having to hold as much hair in my hands. My elevation is really important. I don't want to elevate up to the ceiling. I actually just want to follow head shape, which is why I'm over here. So I want to continue to follow head shape within this elevation. So I can use my mirror to make sure that I'm sending that hair straight out, that I'm not actually lifting it up to the ceiling. And now I'll jump over to this side. And I can use my mirror once again to make sure I'm lifting straight out from the head. My own natural tendency will to be to actually lift beyond where 90 is. Now, just to make sure that I cut everything that was supposed to meet up with this back panel, I'll come through and I'll cross check. I can see a little bit right there. Because I also want to see how much hair, how much extra length is hanging down. Do I want to cut any of that? Because I can imagine this shrinking, but do I want it to totally veil over or do, or do I want to carve it out a bit more? This is where you have choices, you have options. And for the sake of exaggerating, rather than having this relatively steep drop off, I'm gonna cut some of this so that it still falls over a little longer from the sides but that as it actually shrinks and expands, it lives in conjunction with the side panel. So I'm stood directly in front of what I'm working on and I'm pulling the hair down slightly. The lower you hold this line, the heavier it is. The more you elevate that line, the lighter it becomes. So water resets everything. I've been working with her hair, I've been touching it, I've been stretching it, it's drying, there's a number of things happening and so I really want to bring it back and reset it. And from here, we're going to let it air dry. Alright, well she has been styled. We worked 
product through her hair. I ran a little bit of cream, a little bit of volumizing lotion, and a beachy texture spray. And I really wanted to encourage just this fun sense of volume and PCness and nothing overly defined. It's just something kind of messy, something that could look tousled that she could just get her hands in and do this and have it actually kind of live in that area and in, in, in that space. So as far as refinement goes, there's really not very much for me to do. I could come through and slide through some of these pieces. We've got a slight bit of disconnection from the top that's hanging over what was cut shorter through the sides. And at this point, I'm just using the points of my scissor and sliding through to create an overall really soft effect. What I'll do is I'll actually bring her up as close to my eye level as I can. And instead of coming through and trying to put a perfect line throughout, I'm just gonna start grabbing some of these pieces and sliding down through the hair. That's gonna create a softer effect. I'm opening and closing my blade as I go. This is where you get to have fun. This is decorating the house. You put all the work into the technical achievement of this, and now it's time to soften things up a little bit. I wanted to make sure that we established a very definite shape. I'm not just shredding through this and uh, going off of just a strict visual. I want there to actually be definitive shape to this. So I hope you guys like my take on the mullet. This is a really fun, textured, exaggerated shape that's significantly shorter through the front and the sides and then drops off dramatically longer towards the back.